Good evening, Democrats of Virginia. All right, now bear with me. I've got one more favor to ask. I want you to all say one thing with me. It's just one word, but it's important. Goodbye. Okay, all right, ready? One, two, three, goodbye. Listen, this is important because it's what every one of us is gonna have to say to my friend Barbara Comstock in November. <laughs> Finally, Dante, thank you so much for that generous introduction. Truly over the top. Thank you for your service to our country. Now, the truth of the matter is that in my Marine Corps career, I was not always in the heat of battle. After, after the invasion of Iraq, uh, when as we all know now, there was no plan whatsoever for what would come next, we were all starting to get assigned odd jobs. And I was assigned to work with the Iraqi media. Now it was a fascinating position because our fundamental responsibility was to teach Iraq the importance of a free press, something we believed in about 15 years ago. Now, one thing led to another, and an Iraqi guy my age, Muhammad and I, ended up having our own TV show. We called it Molten and Muhammad. We were super creative. But <laughs> before we could get that on, on the air, we simply needed to put something on TV. Because all the Iraqis had ever done was play tapes from the Ministry of Information in Baghdad. You know, before Trump and Fox News, there was Baghdad Bob and the Ministry of Information. Not as different as you might think. So we got them a DVD player, connected it to their transmitter, and what the Iraqis would do is play pirated American movies all day long. Now, one of the mistakes we made is we forgot to explain the ratings system to them. So what would happen is that they would put in some American film they'd never seen before, get to some racy part, and quickly hit eject, and had this 10-volume set of Islamic history videos that they kind of put in to calm everybody down. <laughs> Now, usually this worked fine, but one night, the movie was Basic Instinct. <laughs> if you haven't seen it, there's a certain scene, don't watch it with your parents. <laughs> they weren't quick enough to hit eject. And the next day, there were literally protests all over the province. Women were wailing in the streets, men were throwing rocks, Muhammad and I received death threats. At the end of a very long day, we said, you know, we're just, we just need a break, and so Muhammad said, why don't we go get tea with the Iraqi police? These are guys in their 20s and 30s. Surely they shouldn't be so offended by what they saw on TV last night. But it was a great cultural lesson for this 24-year-old American. Because I walked into this room full of about 30 young Iraqi men, and as soon as they saw me, they were furious. They started yelling at me. And so I turned to Muhammad and I said, Muhammad, what? What are they saying? And he said, sir, they say every time you put a movie on TV, you turn it off right when we get to the good part. <laughs> so we learned a lot from that. We didn't show as many American movies on TV. And as Muhammad and I became closer friends, our TV show started to take off. In the midst of everything that was wrong with Iraq and the war, this was one thing that was actually helping. It was giving Iraqis a taste of a free press. But one morning when I picked up Mohammed for work, I could tell something was wrong before he even got into the truck. He said, Seth, I can't be on TV anymore. Insurgents, the ISIS of the day, had come to his house and threatened to kill his family if he didn't quit, just like Saddam's troops had done to his father a few years before. Now that day, Mohammed said, what we're working on, this episode we're doing right now, is important, so, so we'll just finish this. But then, the next day, Muhammad showed up for work again. And the day after that, Muhammad showed up again. And as the days passed, Muhammad kept showing up. Because Muhammad has never stopped fighting for the freedoms that he saw in our country and so desperately wanted to bring to his. That is the power of American ideals when we actually stand up for them.
And one more thing, Muhammad is continuing this fight today as a proud resident of the Commonwealth of Virginia. That courage that Muhammad showed to simply show up for work every day is the same kind of courage that I have seen across this country this year. And we've needed it because in eight short years, we have gone from a country of yes, we can to no, you can't. If you're a Muslim, you can't live here. If you're black, you can't vote or even breathe. If you're a woman, you can't choose. If you're an immigrant, you can't dream. But anyone who says that about our country is wrong. Wrong about who we are, wrong about what has always made America great. And you don't have to look far to see it. Look at the Parkland kids. Look at what they are doing to guns, to talk about guns in our country. Look at Black Lives Matter. Look at the dreamers. Look at the teachers who are standing up in West Virginia in Oklahoma, in Arizona, in Colorado, and fighting for basic pay. Look at the women. Look at the women in America who, as part of the Me Too movement, are standing up for basic respect. And look right here in Virginia. You know, three years ago, Chris Hurst saw his girlfriend, Arison, Allison Parker, killed on live TV. And tonight, Chris Hurst is sitting in your House of Delegates. A year ago, America had never elected a transgender person to a state legislature. And tonight, Danica Rome sits in, sits in your state legislature. And a year ago, things looked pretty bleak in this country. Donald Trump had just been elected president. Democrats were in their worst position in 100 years across the country. But right here in Virginia, you turned the tide. And you started a wave that has gone to Alabama and the Deep South, to a Trump district in Western Pennsylvania, and to state legislatures across this country. Truly, this change is happening everywhere. There is a new generation of Americans who are standing up and saying, let's have the courage to be honest about the problems that we face and the willingness to take action. This is happening everywhere in America, except in Congress. <laughs> the day after the Parkland shooting, do you know what we voted on? The day after the Parkland shooting in the House of Representatives, we voted on a bill to gut part of the Americans with Disabilities Act. 17 Americans had just been killed. And we started the day in the House by making life more difficult for people in wheelchairs. Now look, this doesn't have to be that hard. I've been traveling all over the country helping get new candidates elected. And I hear what people are saying, what all are, of you are saying. It's true that Americans are hurting, that a lot of Americans are left out of this massive economic transition that's happening across the country. And Americans want jobs in the new economy, not in the old. Everybody in America, no matter where you live, should have a role to play in the new economy. And if you want to go to college, you should have the opportunity to go to college. But if you don't want to go to college and you want to get a vocational degree, you should be respected for that as well. You should be respected for the contributions you make to our community, not just the degree you have hanging on your wall. And we need to build 21st century infrastructure, not this old fashioned infrastructure. We need to build infrastructure so that everybody in America, no matter where you live, can compete for the same jobs on the internet because you all have broadband access. And if your closest job opening is a three-hour job, a three-hour drive from Washington, D.C., 
you ought to be able to get there in 30 minutes on high-speed rail and come home at the end of the day to have dinner with your family. That's 21st century infrastructure. And let me talk for a second about this crazy border wall. Listen, show me a 30-foot wall, I will show you a 35-foot ladder. <laughs> what we actually need is a cyber wall to keep your information safe from companies and to keep Russia out of our elections. That's the wall that we need. Now, I understand that it's one thing to talk simply about the changes that we need to make, and yet another to actually get them done. Sometimes it can feel so frustrating, so hopeless, that our politics is just broken, that we know where we need to go, but we don't know how to get there. So let me just tell you a quick story about political hopelessness from my own experience. When I ran for the first time, I was totally new to politics, no idea what I was doing. I didn't know that you weren't supposed to take on an 18-year incumbent. <laughs> didn't get that memo. But I did. I thought I could do a better job in my district. And so I ran against him. And one of the first pieces of advice I got as a new candidate was you've got to get a good pollster. And so I worked really hard to get a great pollster, one of the best in the business. And I still work with him today. He's amazing. And I still remember where I was standing in my apartment next to the mattress on the floor when he called to discuss the results. Because this first poll is really important. We had been on the campaign trail for eight months. And the poll tells you not only where you stand versus your opponent, but what your pathway to victory is, how you get to where you need to go. So he called up and he said, Seth, you should quit. Your opponent is at 62, you are at eight. <laughs> it is statistically impossible for you to win this race. There is no pathway to victory. That's what he told me. But we didn't quit. We doubled down. We started listening less to the pollster and more to people like you. And we started getting new volunteers, people who'd never been involved in politics before to come out and work on the campaign. I won that primary by 11 points. And a, and a month later, I won the general election by 14 in a district that voted overwhelmingly for our Republican governor. So I think about that story sometimes when I feel like things are a little hopeless in Washington. But I'll tell you what, I do not feel hopeless standing here before you tonight. Because you are taking, you're taking that first step. When things look difficult, you're standing out, you're taking that first step. So that women truly across this country have the right to choose. So that everybody can get an education that they deserve. So that everybody has an opportunity to participate in the economy of the future so that we can truly have health care for all, starting right here in Virginia. We wake up tomorrow in the America that we make. And if the fundamental values of this country are going to be upheld, it is us, it is we, who must uphold them. That's the work that we have to do. Now listen, before I... Before I end, let me say one more thing. For every single one of you, I'm sure there have been times when you've thought about taking that first step, that first step that Muhammad took, the first step that Chris and Danica took, that first step that generations of Americans have taken when we see change that needs to happen and we recognize that we're the ones who need to do it. But there have been times when we've all been told, like I was in that race, that your work isn't gonna matter, your vote's not gonna count, your door knock is not gonna make a difference. So I just wanna ask, everybody in the room tonight who's running for office even though you've been told you will lose, 
Please stand up. We owe you all a round of applause. Stand up. Stand up. There's a lot of you. I'm standing up, too. Now, keep standing. Camp, keep standing, Senator. Keep standing. I want everybody who has knocked on a door this year and been told that that knock wouldn't make a difference to stand up as well. Stand up. If you've knocked on a door, if you've helped contribute, stand up. Stand up. We owe you a round of applause as well. And finally, stand up if you are going to vote in November. Stand up. That's all of us. We can change America. We can change these politics. And you know what? When Congress doesn't listen, we are going to change Congress. And two years from now, when the White House doesn't, we're going to change that guy in the White House as well. I am proud to be in this fight with you. Thank you all very much, Virginia Democrats.